Welcome to Fighting on Film, the podcast about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to cover it. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. I'm Robbie of Barrow Military History. Grab your oozies, prime your grenades, and lace up your combat boots. It's Mercenary Month on the Fighting on Film Podcast. Welcome back to Fighting on Film. This is the second installment of Merc Month, where we're looking at some of the classic and more obscure mercenary films. This week, we are looking at Jack Cardiff's 1968 cult classic, Dark of the Sun. Oh, it's a lot more of a mercenary film than, say, Codename Wild Geese's, because it's actually based on a little bit of true history. It is about Captain Curry and his band of mercenaries, or his mercenary unit. They're not all mercenaries. Um, some are actual Congolese army that he's conscripted into his little band. He's sort of um, a Western veteran of World War II. Yep. And he's commanding a uh, Congolese commando unit, basically, isn't he? That's it, yeah. He's t- he's, he's brought in by the, the Congolese government to help um, rescue some villagers. That's right. So they're they're in a, uh, I think it's like a, a company mining town. That's it. Um, up in the north somewhere, down the train line. Mm. And Curry's brought in um, by at the request of the Congo's president. That's it. And he has a meeting with uh, the president and a mining exec from one of these companies that are di- uh, basically diamond mining. Mm. The, the mining exec is like, we need to get our people out from this mining town. Yep. But the, the president's no nonsense. He's like, no, there's diamonds involved. Mm. We need we need these diamonds. Otherwise, the mining companies are basically going to stop backing my, my government. Yep. And it, yep. he has this great line where he's like, we have three days to save the Congo. That's it. And it's $50 million yeah. dollars worth of diamonds. Huge sum in those days. Huge. Curry's cut would be 50K, which is, is a fair old whack. Um, yeah. So yeah, the plot picks up there, and um, we'll, we'll you know we'll talk about more as we go along, alley tally and all that. But we have to mention that it's basically a train movie. Mm-hmm. It is re- a real A to B movie. You know, they start off at the train station where they're arming up this armored train, um, and then they make it to the village, get the um, villagers. Then they're attacked by the Simbas. And all hell kicks off then. Yeah. And then they're back in the village. It's sort of standard war movie um, fare, probably until I'd say the last 45 minutes to an hour. And then it actually like, it gets really sort of violent and visceral and gritty. And mm. there's, there's a complete tonal shift. I don't know what I was expecting. So I'd heard really good things like all you listeners and all the people in, in Twitter land were like, dark of the sun, dark of the sun, chainsaws. Oh my God. But then it was sort of, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But then it was sort of, it was completely, it was not what I was expecting. And it was actually... It was the artsiest Merc movie I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and there's a reason for that. It was directed by Jack Cardiff. And he is mm. a an Oscar winning um, cinematographer. And he's worked on so much cinematographer on A Matter of Life and Death. African Queen, uh, War and Peace, and of course, uh, The Dogs of War, which... Coming up. Spoilers, we will be covering this Merc month. We will be. We have a director who is an Oscar-winning cinematographer who brings a real eye to it. It's treated to the work of um, Edward Scariff, who's mm. the cinematographer on the movie. And he's worked with Cardiff for decades. Yep. Um, and he's, you know, he, he worked on stuff like Khartoum, uh, The mm. Dirty Dozen, um, 633 Squadron. So he knows how to make a war movie and he knows how to make it look good. And that is one thing that this film is. It looks beautiful really really beautifully shot just some of these sequences like there's a the sequence where they where they arm the train yeah the level the level of the skill that's brought to that sequence you know the the yeah the artistic framing of the shots and cinematography the cuts the way it moves from different angles you're looking at someone stoking up the engine yeah putting sandbags down there's these like great smashing shots of you know the couplings hitting each other it knocked me back i was like this is really nicely shot this is like peak montage of them getting the train ready big names really love this movie you know scorsese and tarantino Mm -hmm. they cite this movie as being like one of their favorites tarantino has a an edition that he shows at his some of his film festivals allegedly he has the uncut version but yeah getting back to production very quickly 
it was written by uh, the original book, Dark of the Sun, was written by Wilbur Smith, and the, the screenplay was adapted uh, by Ranald McDougall. Fans of the Wild Geese will remember the name Mad Mike Hoare, and he was quite a famous mercenary in the Congo in the 60s, and his five commando were very active during that time. Um, and he actually serves as technical advisor on the movie. And obviously, uh, we, we will touch on it, but the movie is very violent for the time, very violent and visceral and, and sort of very, very hard hitting for, for 1968 audiences. It was something that was um, revered for it. But it really does mirror the time because the Congo crisis with the, with the Simba uprising. I, I did some research this week, reading articles, looking at videos. I mean, some of the stuff coming out of the re- that, that area at the time. Horrific. It's madness, really. You know, some of the things that you can, you can see. Some of the worst possible stuff you can imagine happened in Congo at that point. Like uh, missionaries being torched and people being just openly shot in the streets, things like that. It's so shocking. True to life, the movie doesn't pull its punches. It does go out of its way to say, look, the Congo at the time, it was a hotbed of, of violence. So at least it, it's mirroring the, the true history. The film does a pretty good job of sort of not glossing over that. That's exactly it. You know, it. it. It can't show it exactly, but it, it shows and hints Mm. at what it can we'll talk about that more when we talk about that big climactic yes. scene i'm sure but then it also has these like really strange sort of campy 60s moments one minute men are talking about how they're how they used to have i think it's um haven't gone into characters yet but there's a german mercenary mm-hmm. and he goes on about oh when i was a boy we had um uh fencing a fencing um, club. Oh yeah, he talks about how they sort of settle their differences in duels and stuff. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, duels and things. And then the next minute, there's a chainsaw fight. <laughs> so it's like, what the fuck? You're like this movie's its tone just shifts in on a, on a dime. You know, it's so weird. And it's an MGM MGM production. Quick shout out to the brilliant theme and soundtrack by um, Jacques Lossier. Beautiful. As soon as you get that opening sequence, a color wash over scenes from the film. Mm. You see uh, some of the characters getting people on the train and, and that kind of thing and moving around. Mm. And you just get this really beautiful sort of like piano yeah. uh, piece. It doesn't make you immediately think war movie. It might make kind of make, make you think like suspense movie, perhaps. Wait, it reminded me of the Wild Geese intro. But later it evolves and it, you know, it becomes like... It does. It's quite, it's quite stirring and rousing, isn't it? It's a great piece of music. It's really good. But yeah, I just wanted to like give that a quick mention. That opening intro really reminded me of the Wild Geese. That's all I could have mapped. Like the the start of the Wild Geese, we've got the pictures mm. of the of like the with the orange red sort of effect put over them. That really reminded me of it. I think I mentioned it when we were watching it. But let's go into cast before we we delve back into the plot. Yeah, it's a really good cast actually, and everyone's on form too. Such a great cast. Um, so you got Rod Taylor. He plays Captain Curry. He's an Australian mm-hmm. Australian actor. Um. Uh, more recently, um, viewers might, listeners even, might um, recognise him as playing Churchill in Inglorious Bastards. And that brings in the, the Tarantino love of this movie. Yeah, You've got Jim Brown as Rufo, who just come off of being in the Dirty Dozen. An Ice Station Zebra? I think so. I think so. Yeah, just before, I think, perhaps. You've got Kenneth Moore, of all people, playing Doctor... Is it Doctor Reed? Doctor Reed. Mm. Spelt W-R... Reed with a W. He's in sync the Bismarck. 39 Steps. Northwest Frontier, which is another train movie. Yeah, he plays a hard drinking doctor. I would like to have seen more of him. Off topic quick, but at this time in his career, he this was the first film he was in um had been in for four years. Um Oh really? Yeah, apparently he came out of semi-retirement to to do it. Um and then he after it wrote in his autobiography that the experience of of the film, he didn't enjoy it. And apparently mm. Taylor and and um, Brown, they weren't the best of friends on set. He didn't enjoy the experience. So he afterwards, he sort of goes into more sort of cameo roles and things. You've got Peter Carsten as uh, the German uh, mercenary Henlein. And then you've got Yvette Mimio as Claire. And she is, um, she's plays a, a, I think she was living on a, a on a farm or something. Yeah. And she's, yeah. her character's found. Yeah, just as they're getting into sort of like Simba territory, mm. they they see her running towards the train and, you know, the, the farm's on fire, there's people dead. But fun fact, she was in uh, The Time Machine with Rod Taylor in 1960. Well, there you go. I mean, that's your main, main cast. They're the people you see most. They're the people you see most, yeah. Uh, Andre uh, Morel plays um, sort of the head of the, the company mining. 
operation? Boussier. Great cast. Rod Taylor plays a hard as nails mercenary quite well. Henlon mm. is larger than life as this as the villain of the piece. If the Simbas weren't scary enough, then Henlon does his best. He's a proper bastard, yeah. I guess we should sort of get back to the plot a little bit before the alley tally. It's it's not a, a simple film. No, it's not. Um, it's deceptively you know complex to it. So, as we mentioned, they are heading to this town down the rail line. They've armoured up the train. They've got like 450 cals, yep. sandbagged it, company of men on board. More than enough for three days to sort out these. Definitely. Uh, get up get up country, get the people, get out. And then they're attacked by uh, an aircraft. Yes, P P-51 Mustang. That I think it's the UN. Yeah, he mentions, Curry mentions like, oh, you've, you've got to tell the UN forces mm. in the area what I'm doing because I don't want to be attacked by my own side um, before we go. And then lo and behold... They're spotted by a, a UN plane. Um, eventually, they get into a tunnel yep. and, and the, the plane is, gets damaged and flies off. Mm-hmm. Um, then, then we carry on and eventually Claire is picked up and then we get to the the, the, the town, the company town, yep. the mining town. Well, hang on, before that, Henlin guns down two children. Oh God, yeah, yeah, that is true. We did, so yeah, there's a couple of stops and the tension sort of like up, isn't there? Mm. And the first stop, they come across two kids. Yep. And they talk to them. And they let, then I think Corey says, you know, let them go to the nearest village or whatever. Or just just get rid of them. Mm. Um, and Henline takes that a little bit too. Literally. And the next thing you hear is like a burst of, mach- of submachine gun fire. They're really young. And his reckoning is that Simba's used them as spies. If, if he didn't come across as, as a little bit suspicious before, that's the first thing you go, oh, hang on a minute, he's he's not going to be a very nice man throughout this movie. There's a power struggle between him and Curry because mm. he's like, no, no, I don't, don't hire him, but I need him. I need his expertise. Probably worth mentioning uh, the introduction of the character at that point. Rufo and Curry are, are, are talking about their plan for the, you know, the mission. And Rufo says, you need that guy. And he points through a window of the bar mm-hmm. um, at uh, Heinlein. Yep. And Heinlein is a former Nazi. Well, he's still a Nazi. Bloody swastika medallion hanging from his yeah, pocket. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and there's a great little uh, interaction between him and um, Curry, mm. Taylor's character. He points at the swastika in his pocket and he says, get rid of that. It makes me forget who I'm supposed to be mad at. Yep. So obviously there's a hint there that Curry has formerly been, you know, in the army during World War II. He's having to work with a former enemy. There's another aside that there was actually a, a German mercenary um, in the Congo called Siegfried Müller, and he wore an Iron Cross out there. Yeah. Um, so it's based on a little bit of truth as well. I think so. I, I think I think it's only a swastika um, because it's a good you know sort of visual device. It's slightly more obvious than an Iron Cross. Mm. And he's still got his German field cap on. He's set up as the villain. Yeah. Enemy within sort of Enemy within. deal, isn't it? Yeah. Before they get to the mining village, even, there's a chainsaw fight. And it is outrageous. So they've picked up Claire. They've he's he shot those two poor little boys. Um, and how and how now those Congolese lads didn't frag him right there, and then I don't know. Yeah, exactly. The tensions continue to ramp. And um he's sort of like chatting up Claire on the in the in the carriage, isn't he? Mm, yeah. Um and Curry tells him to leave her alone, let her sleep. And he gets he, they they get off the train and talk, you know, man to man. Man to man, yeah. Uh, and it, that comes in with that, you know, like the dueling element that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and Heimlein basically sucker punches him. Well, he gives he gives him one in the gives him one in the chest with his swagger stick. And it you know it escalates into this big fight, and and Heimlein uh, grabs a chainsaw. They've been cutting down trees to. Yep power with the steam engine i hadn't i'll be honest i hadn't seen the film before and i was thought do they both have chainsaws or is it just one of them has chainsaws yeah it's just one <laughs> and it's not that actual chainsaw like sword fight no which would have been completely bizarre and been crazy. possibly ruined the movie yeah um very tarantino um which very we'll tarantino to. yeah but um yeah so they have this this fight and eventually cory gets the better of him mm. knocks him under the train doesn't he yeah he, <laughs> he, stick, he, he lands a few good punches on him mm. um gets the chainsaw off him after his midriff is saved by his 37 pound belt buckles which is absolutely amazing um whoever says 37 pound webbing is rubbish watch this film because it saves a man's life it's robust enough to withstand a chainsaw war department never let us down <laughs> 
<laughs> so he knocks Heinlein under the under the train, and it's on a, he's on a he's on the train track, and it's this this big proper you know yeah, he's got his head basically under the wheel, hasn't he? And this massive like cast iron wheel. He just says casually to the to the stoker, "Are you ready to go?" And this this absolute lad yeah. of a of a train driver, a uh, train chomping on a cigar, chomping on a cigar. She's like, "Yep, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm I'm good to go, boss." And then and Highland starts, you know, does the classic, "Please don't kill me, don't kill me, please." Oh, I'm sorry. You know, he sort of he turns into absolute wimp. He's got him underneath this train, and you're like, "Oh my god, he's going to crush the man's skull. He's going to kill him." Yeah, because the train starts rolling. Yeah, Rufo saves him. He pulls Curry off and drags him out. And he throws Curry to the ground and he says, no, damn it, we need him. Yeah. And you're thinking, why do you need him? Like, he's just murdered two little yeah. boys. Yeah. He's just tried to kill the commanding officer with a fucking chainsaw. Yeah. Do you need him? Exactly. Probably not. No. But I guess at that point, you know, they have a company of men and they need all the officers they can get because yeah. there's a younger officer who's a bit unsteady. Yeah. Um, that, you know, there's a scene during when the plane attacks, he sort of like freezes up. That's it. So I guess maybe Rufo was thinking, we need officers. It's never really implied why they need him. Maybe maybe the men trust him, you know, implicitly, despite him being a proper bastard. He could strike fear enough to get them to do yeah. what they want, you know. But yeah, so so that scene is out, absolutely outrageous. And you think, okay, mm. there's your chainsaw fight. It can't get any more mad. Oh, but it does. So <laughs> they get into the town. Straight to the diamonds. Straight to the diamonds. Straight to the the the, the mine. And they, it's they get there, and the guy goes, "Oh, great, you're here, fantastic!" So they get all. The, everyone's stood there with their suitcases yeah, ready to go. Re- like, everyone's ready for the uh, on the platform. Everyone's ready for the mercenary express. Um, <laughs> so they get on, you know, and and they're all they're all sitting there happily. And uh, the Boussier man, the 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 sort of the model, yeah, Andre Morel's character. Yeah, he goes, "Oh, I've I, I didn't know when you were coming, so I set the I set the the timer wrong." I've set the timer wrong, so you can't have the diamonds now. You have to wait three hours. Yeah, you can't unset the timer to open up the vault. Yeah, you can't do that. So Curry's no. pissed because he's like, now we've got to sit. We're sitting ducks for three hours, and the Simbas are on their way. Like, come on. So they go and have a look at the vault, and it is the most elaborate. It's like Fort Knox from from Goldfinger, isn't it? And yeah, exactly. We were saying that's proper goldfinger vibes well goldfinger um because it has that same sort of like concrete walls big round vault mm-hmm. door and even the timer on the wall looks a bit like the nuclear bomb that sean connery is trying to disarm that's it you keep expecting um, like shirley bassey to sort of kick in yeah or something to throw a hat so yeah exactly yeah <laughs> throw a beret <laughs> he can't get into the vault for three hours so no then someone tells him yeah there's some nuns up at the the, the mission hospital you should go and rescue them yeah, and and he and he's like, yeah, okay, I'll go and do that. But he doesn't tell his men he's going to go and do that. Yeah, he just he just gets in that jeep and sods off. Like, Christ, go at least tell your men where you've gone. Uh, so he, he zips off in a jeep. <laughs> but then there's a great little section with um, Heinlein and and um, Doctor Reed getting pissed in a bar mm-hmm. and like having a bit of a like shooting practice. <laughs> it is really cool. Yeah, it's like the the spinning the the spinning round. Yeah. And then trying to shoot a target, yeah. like a bottle on the bar. And if more lets off of a, a grease gun. Yeah, he gives him the grease gun. It's so good. It's so good. Anyway, yeah. They find the nuns and there's a pregnant lady and they, they bring mm. Kenneth Moore with them. He ha- He's a drunk in the whole film. That's his whole character thing. He's a drunk. Yeah, so he's introduced and it's a brilliant introduction at the beginning of the movie. Corey comes into his office and he brings him a bottle of whiskey and he's like, I need a doctor for three days. Yep. Uh, and he says, we're going on this mission. Would it, wouldn't it be great if, you know, you came along? There's lots of like back and forth between them, a bit of banter, a bit of laughter. And it's just really great to see Kenneth Moore doing doing this such a good impression of a mm. drunk sort of man of the world doctor. Curry goes up to leave and he takes the whiskey with him mm-hmm. and he goes, yeah. leave the bottle. You're going to leave the bottle, aren't you? Yeah. And he's like, I'll send someone for you. Because he knows he's going to be absolutely fucking paralytic in the morning. Lo and behold, when he turns up to get on the train, someone actually bundles him into the train. It's really, <laughs> Kenneth Moore, he gives so much to the movie. One of the best performances of the film for me. He is. He's great in it. It comes to the, the four when he gets to the you know the hospital. Mm-hmm. And this lady needs a C-section. That's it. He basically says, I, I can't leave. I need to do this. Mm-hmm. And Moore knows full well that if he stays, he's going to, the Simbas will come and they will kill them all. Mm-hmm. Um Yep. He says, you've got two days max. He just agrees. Like he finally he understands he 
Reed wants to stay, Moore wants to stay, do, you know, he, he's going to have two good sober days. He's going to be a doctor, like a proper yeah. doctor. Like it's epiphany. Where he's not just sewing people up that have been shot. Yeah. He's actually helping people. That's it. Really well acted mm, scene really for good. Moore. Good you know, moment he, of clarity. He, you know, he does a lot of it with just, you know, expression. Mm. Like uh, Claire, the character Claire says, you know, won't you come along? Or, you know, she just looks at him and says, Dr. Reed. And he just gives her this little knowing, look, reassuring look. Mm. But then, unfortunately... About 10 minutes later, as the vault's opening, as the time is going down, mm -hmm. the Simbas arrive, mob-handed. There's, there's got to be hundreds. It's implied there's a few hundred of them. Battalion of Simbas right there. You brought mortars, Robbie. They brought mortars. So you know it's a oh. battalion element when they brought mortars. They've got, the, yeah, they've got their own mortar sections. They storm the village. And luckily, the vault opens just in time. The diamonds are snatched. Everyone's getting on the train. The, um, they have set up a 50 cal to sort of cover the trains. Oh, yeah. I love that. Really good. So they start putting small arms fire down. Yeah, Headline sort of like takes commander's knees, like get the 50 on the on the like the water tender and they're all opening up. And the, the sim, it's a really beautifully shot sequence. The Simbas are sort of like coming off the hills. We're getting into fave scenes now, guys. But, you know, so the Simbas are pouring down the hill. The guys on the train are opening up. And there's a great little sequence where Taylor is bundling Claire and uh, Boussier up onto the train. And the Simbas are coming around the back of the station and he opens up with his Sterling, oh. cuts about five guys down, yeah, yeah. jumps on the train. Just a beautiful little sequence. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. But that whole sequence of the Simbas, that's the first time you really see them as well. Mm. Mm. So it's that moment where you're like, uh, this is what they're afraid of. And you can see why, because they're just, they're, they're just going for it. Yeah, you know, that no... Not even like the, the, the 50 caliber machine gun or, or any of the sort of no. the better weaponry that the mercenaries have sort of scares them into sort of being more tactful in their approach. No, they are. They are just they're just coming on waves and waves. They're running forward. They've got like number fours and SMLEs and then most of them have just got spears. If they stay here, they're going to all be goners pretty quickly. Yeah, it's a frenzied attack, isn't it? So they're coming away from the uh, the town. They're still getting shot at. And the mortars start opening up on the trains. Mm -hmm. And one of them gets, I think it's an indirect hit. It hits one of the couplings or something, doesn't it? All the civilians in the train carriage start going backwards into the town. And you get this like shock look of everyone's like, <gasps> you know, it's really well it's done. It's horror. Absolute horror. And then this mm. Boussier gets out a pistol and shoots his wife in the head and himself before they before they get there. So then, You would. You would. Exactly. We'll go in. This is King's favorite scene territory, so we'll we'll, we'll wrap up a little bit of the plot. Mm -hmm. Go to Ali Tally, come back, but then the sort of main action comes in where you have Curry and Rufo go back into the town to retrieve the diamonds because the diamonds were lost. Yeah, the diamonds were on the train carriage that rolled back into the town. Yeah. So they have this sequence where they have to infiltrate in, and there's an unbelievable bar battle. And we'll come back into that after the Ali Tally. It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. One word for you, Robbie. Sterlings. Sterlings, Sterlings, Sterlings. Sterlings. <laughs> so the film begins. Curry and Rufo land at the airport. Yep. They're off to see the Congolese uh, president. The UN are looking after the airport. There's a UN lieutenant. Swedish. Swedish lads, mm -hmm. correct. Wrong rifles. As you pointed out, shouldn't have been fouls, should have been G3s. Should have been Swedish versions of G3s. AK4s, I believe. It's, it's only a small thing. Yeah, but the main star of that sequence is Curry and Rufo's Sterlings. So they're both, they've both got Sterling Mark 4s, mm -hmm. sort of like slung over their shoulders. The UN lieutenant wants to take them off them. Yep. No no weapons in the airport. Basically presents orders that he's going to see the, the president. They reluctantly let through. Mm. Um, and that's the first time we see the Sterlings. Really good. And then they're a constant presence throughout the film. Mm. Um, it's basically uh, Rufo and Curry's main sidearm. Mm -hmm. um, and there's loads of great sequences of, of them in action. Really good. The only the only letdown is uh, they hold the mags instead of the yeah. uh, the barrel case. Yeah, well, I was watching it with Matt and he was like, oh, that, that's not the way you fire a Sterling. Come on. It's not as bad. It's not as unforgivable as holding the mag of a Sten. Yes. Because the Sten mag, that would ha hamper feeding. But the Sterling magazine's so good, like one of the best submachine gun magazines around. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of okay. I'm going to let them slide. Yeah. And if you want to know more about the Sterling, Matthew Moss did write a book on it, and it's available from all good bookshops. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, yeah, and a, a true to form though. Talking about Sterling's jamming, um, when uh, Rufo is shooting at some Simbas from the train, there's a little sequence, and he has a bit of an issue mm. with, with the jams. And you can see him sort of charging the bolt, like trying mm-hmm. to trying to unjam his Sterling, and he's only getting like single shots off. It's quite funny that bit. Probably having like trouble with the blanks they were using. Ah, probably. Yeah, it's a good point. Mm. If it was just firing single shots, it probably wasn't cycling properly. But no, you're you're, you're right. There's some cracking bits with um with Curry swing. He swings round with his Sterling and, and, and takes out like four lads um, with yeah, one at sweep. the train station where they're about to yeah. jump on the train. That sequence that I you know, mentioned earlier, but it's so good. Any other alley picks? There's so much interesting stuff in there. You know, got loads of, of sort of like um, British army kit, you know, with the webbing and such that, that Taylor's got on. A cool inclusion is the, the three inch mortars. Yeah. That are so integral to the plot. You know, they, they take out the train coupling for the carriage that rolls back into town. And it's just they get some really arty shots of the mortars coming out of the barrels too. Really nice. And it's just, it's nice to see mortars. You know, there's an extended mortar sequence in, if you remember, um, Go For Broke. Um, mm. And that's really yeah. nice to see. It's just something about mortars because they're so widely used. They're quite integral to an infantry. It's, Basically, they're important weapons. Exactly. And they're very downplayed, I think, the mortar, the humble mortar. Um, but it's just really nice to see them in action. I, I just love, I just love seeing them more in action. I think they're, they're very cool, aren't they? I do like them. They are. And then yeah. there's a blink and you, and you'll miss it. Um, Mark one star Sten. Oh yes, yes. Uh, that, very unusual. The the Simba, I think the Simba leader is is seen mm. brandishing it a few times. Lots of um, FN Fowls SLRs, which are like quintessentially that Cold War sort of era. There's an SKS as well. Chekhov's SKS. When they go back to, to sort of see if Reed has survived or not, or you know, to pick him up because they're going that way, um, because they've uh, the train's been knocked out by the mortars, mm-hmm. so they, they basically get into trucks yep. um, to head to head back. But they stop off at the hospital, yep. and um, Rufo picks up an SKS that's been discarded, um, and it's sort of like it's it's Chekhov's SKS at that point, it where it's 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 the loaded gun in the room at that point, um, which just to jump back into the plot a little bit um it sort of comes to a head with the headline oh yes he wants the diamonds and he rather brutally murders rufo mm. using the sks uh, folded bayonet yep which is probably the only time i've ever seen an sks bayonet used in a film yeah true yeah actually true yeah i think it's the first only one of the few times i've seen sks in a film anyway yeah um but it's a really really interesting mm. sort of like scene because cinematically rufo sat waiting for a radio call mm in the back of a, a of a truck that isn't a Bedford, and <laughs> yeah, oh god, yeah. <laughs> the only the only letdown. Henline stabs him through the the canvas mm. of the of the of the the truck. Yeah, hood. and the, you see the, the the blade come through his chest. And it's yeah, it's quite, and he lets out a hell of a scream. He does, and it's a really visceral sort of like moment. There's a good bit of dialogue around this case. Made with German steel, paid for by French francs, made in a communist factory shipped over here on an african airline funded by american dollars yeah it's just like wow that kind of sort of sums up i wonder if that's taken verbatim from wilbur smith's novel probably is yeah yeah Mm. and that's and obviously that's you know there were so many different sort of weapons floating around that country but you do you know east germany was involved in, in in africa at the time you know it was it was one of its only few exporters was was african the countries was was east germany so you yeah. know it's sort of it's it's a nice little insight into the history and i like that they, that they had it in there it does make you think but for me i mean for, for my alley this week there's, only, there's a few things i picked out we thought it was an austin champ yes because by god it looks like one right but it's not it's a 60s toyota land cruiser the jeep that um curry's i didn't know land in. cruisers went back that far i didn't either but it is it's featured so heavily um, there'll, mm. there'll be a little uh, little little something on the Twitter that I'm knocking up about the Land Cruiser, um, <laughs> the Mercenary's Choice. That's all I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of trucks in it, but they look like Bedfords, but they're not Bedfords. It's a shame. Deeply disappointing. That that would have risen like this film to another level if it had just a half a dozen Bedfords. I was absolutely <sighs> fucking crushed. I was like, they're Bedford RLs, and then they weren't. And I was like, <laughs> no. Um, I thought there was one at the beginning, though. It's not. Oh, shit. It's not. It looks like one, but it's not. And I think, for me, I just like Henlon's costume. Mm. 
<laughs> it's signaling to you the whole movie something about him's off it's hello i'm from the africa core <laughs> you know? yeah hello i fought one these eighth army sort of look he's got his german field cap it's either an original africa core jacket or it's been made up to look like one mm. you know it's this is swastika badge it's his i think he might be even be wearing jack boots i'm not quite sure he's definitely wearing a got mittens um got mittens belt exactly yeah. with his P- p38 holster and it looks like he's just hopped off of a, a ketten craft dad in the in the <laughs> desert you know it's quite um it's just obvious to everyone watching that he is evil he's going to be a bad bastard and he was exactly and the other thing he's got, and I think it's the only time I've seen it properly used on film, is the 37 pattern binocular pouch. Oh, God, it's yeah. it's actually got binoculars in it. Actually has binoculars in it, yeah. And it's not being used by the woman who's on sea home guard as ammo pouches. Absolutely wild. Really cool. You can tell that Rufo and Curry have been doing mercenary work for ages because they both pretty much use the same small arms. The mercenary's choice, the Sterling Mark IV. Yes, exactly. Henlon's got his grease gun. Should have been an MP40. That would have been cool. Should have been an MP40. It's well thought out. Unlike last week, Codename Wild Geese, just felt a bit cobbled together. Someone sat down and thought, right, okay, these guys are going to have this, these guys are going to have that. And it just makes it a bit more believable. Yeah. I wonder if Mike Hall said, well, I used a Serling, so get one of them. Quite possibly. Yeah, there's an attention to mise-en-scene and, and stuff, which is yeah, exactly very much appreciated. It, it sort of lifts the film to that, you know, another level. It really does. Shout out to the, the M2 Brownings. Oh, yeah, yeah. Too. Didn't mention those. The, the mock-up M2 Brownings. Yeah, they're, they're kind of real. Like The receivers look real. Mm. And then extension is is solid, and it shouldn't be, you know, where the barrel mm. sort of like projects from. Um, and they're quite clearly not firing. Yeah, they're, they're not. <laughs> there's no recoil or anything like that. And No. There's a, there's a, little, there's a shot where Henline's sort of like shaking it brutally <laughs> yeah, to make it look it's firing. That classic. But the Stalins and some of the rifles are blank firing, so that's good to that's see. Nice. So it's not all sort of mocked up. Um, but yeah, a lot of alley kit. Just what you want in a Merc movie. Quality. Quality Merc gear. So, favourite scenes? Got to be that climactic scene where the carriage rolls back into the town. Yeah, that's pretty pivotal. It's pivotal to the plot, but it's also heartrending. Mm. And you know it's you know it's bad as soon as as soon as that mortar round hits and the carriage separates and the carriage rolls backwards and the screams of all of the civilians and all the men, you know, women and children on the train. It cuts to the interior, and as you mentioned earlier. Um, the head of the mining operation he pulls out a little Beretta. Doesn't show it, but he's, he's going to shoot his wife and shoot himself. He does, yeah. Because that's how bad the, the Stimbers are. There's people throwing themselves up off the train uh, into the ravine. And then as they get into the village, the, the train sort of run, rolls to a stop and it's engulfed mm. by a crowd of Stimbers. And then the next and- time you see them, everyone who you've seen, because they're quite mm. well dressed, everyone's dressed in a way where the next time you see them, yeah. you know who they were. So... Boosie's wearing a suit and it's quite, he's the only one wearing that sort of suit. So mm. next time you see him and it's just him slumped over, a few of the women were wearing quite colourful dresses and, and they're quite clearly slumped over dead. The Simba's trying to get the spoils of war and it is just so, it's so visceral. You're getting, you know, women are being dragged through the streets, men are being thrown around like toys, you know, proper hard hitting. And for a, for a 1968 film to make me as a, 27 year old in 2021 actually go fuck me actually that it affected me actually it not it, it made me want to go away and research because i was like if this is how yeah. the movie is showing it i wonder how it actually was and as i said earlier yeah. jesus and it's worse yeah <laughs> again to the cinematography but there's some quick shots where it pans over the the train mm. and you see their clothes are ripped yeah some of the women are sort of like bare chested yeah and it's it's hinting at you know they've been mauled they've been raped mm. they've been you know the scene inside the carriage is just carnage and it pans over that box of diamonds so the diamonds curry shouts to uh, morel's character put them in my caboose you the train carriage at the front of the train um as he's running he should have really done it himself yeah he, but should he, have, he yeah. wanted to go and he was trying to help defend yeah. them yeah morel's character sees his wife who is hysteric shouting for him properly and yeah. as you would you would go to your wife mm. wouldn't you mm, definitely but he takes the diamonds with him and that's how they fall into the Simba's hands. Mm. And the next time we see them, they're in 
the bar, yep. the mining town's bar, which is sort of the epicenter for the carnage and yeah, chaos it's all going off in there. that engulfs the town once the Simbas take over. We got to talk about the the infiltration by Curry and um, Rufo. They, you know, they go right. We've got to go back and get the diamonds. We have to. It's the job. You know, it's the job. They they can't get out otherwise. They need to go back into the town to get yeah. trucks anyway. And, and if they don't get the the diamonds, that the whole country will collapse because the, the government won't have money to to fund yeah. the fight back. Um, that's how it's poised anyway. Basically, three days to save the Congo. Mm. So set up for the scene is we have a sort of. Earlier in the film, Rufo's mentioned how that he he's Congolese. He's Western educated Congolese. He's gone to university in the US, come back. He doesn't want his country to go backwards. He wants his country to go forwards. He, yeah, he's sort of the totem for the future of the Congo. And he says, I came from the trees. I won't go back to them. What a line. And it's a great, really, really good speech. The, 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 I've got it here if you want me to read it. Brilliant. Go for it. I came down from the trees by invitation and I'll kill anybody who tries to send me back up. Russian, Chinese, English, Belgian, United States, you take your pick. That line just hints at all of the fingers that are in, you know, the Central African pie at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Cold War that's going on. Mm. So after that, Curry and Rufo have to work out how they're going to get back into um, the, 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 the village. Yeah, we get like a proper little military operation, mm, don't we? Mm. So they're, you know, they're, they're, they're working out how they're going to do it. You know, you think, how are they going to do it? They can't go full front of the salt. There's not enough of them. You know, they'd be massacred. Yeah. So what they do is Rufo strips down to his waist, takes all his jacket off and his thing. Mm-hmm. They hide the, the Sterlings beside them and he, and he carries in Curry acting as a Simba, you know, trying to just blend in. Yeah. So the diamonds are on like a, a snooker table or a pool table in the middle of the bar. That's it, yeah. They get up the stairs. They they get stopped by some Simbas, don't they? On guard, yeah. And he, he, he basically punched their way past them. Yeah. Um, but it, it's missed because of the ruckus and the chaos that's going on in this bar. Um, and they get to this sort of point, like a, a mezzanine that overlooks the bar. Mm-hmm. And that's when all hell breaks loose because they open up on the Simbas below. Yep. Taylor throws a couple of Mills bombs down, which kicks things off. Unload about four mags each <laughs> yeah, they do. from their Sterlings. Yeah. And you're getting proper reloads. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh my God, they're reloading. Really good. That's such a... I bet my call was like, yeah, you're going to reload. You have to reload, yeah. Yeah, none of that movie magic, mm. endless magazine. Really nice. Like, you can see them, like, under stress, like, they're trying to rush to get the mags in. Mm. And it's really well done set piece. You know, it all sort of... It, it all goes to pot because the, the, they try and steal a, a, a fuel truck and it gets blown up. So then they have to swap the train out for a train of trucks. So it, mm-hmm. it, it sort of... It ramps the film again because you're like, oh, God, now they can't get out on the train. Yeah, Henline's been tasked with capturing the uh the trucks and then doing a diversion to sort of help them escape but that whole bar scene is so tarantino very it's incredibly tarantino like you can tell he's watched this and gone yeah so you know that scene in inglorious bastards where they're firing into the crowd of nazis on the balcony that, that's it it's a pastiche it's taken literally yeah it's 100 yeah. pastiche it's taken literally from this movie and there's the shots in the film as well like the sort of the big like the sort of quick, quick close-ups of people mm. and their reaction shots. That's very, you get a lot of that in Inglourious Bastards as well. But that scene's so dynamic. So, so Taylor jumps down from the mezzanine mm. onto the pool table, punches a Simba, grabs up the diamonds. Mm. And then all the, all the while, like Rufo on the, on the landing is like laying down fire, keeping these Simbas back, covering him. He clambers back up and they, and they, escape out onto a balcony and there's there's it's just really nice sort of like choreographed set piece. yeah it's really well done um it's very well done and you never I, you never feel that they're one man army you never feel like they're too powerful as, mm. as a mercenary force you you always you always feel like okay now they're going to get overwhelmed yeah N- now that now now that the game's up but no through that through good sort of leadership and and marksmanship and all that they do make it out so mm-hmm. it is somewhat believable yeah because they're covering each other and that's the beauty of it so there's a point where someone grabs curry and and rufo just absolutely clobbers him over the balcony mm. and they jump over and then jump onto the truck and they basically escape the town but the the, the fuel truck gets hit doesn't it it does yeah and it blows up so for me i mean i i mean there's so many so much you can pick you know and i i was thinking okay you know i could do the end fight but I might leave that to the listeners to go off and watch, or we might talk about it in final thoughts. Mm. Um, 
you know, the, we've talked about the train scene, the great cinematography there. But for me, it's such a small little bit. And it's just, just some of the dialogue. And as we say, it's very Tarantino-esque, you know, zingers. People have, people have some proper zingers at each yeah. other. And um, for me, there's one where there's a correspondent in the in the bar where they're where they're planning the op. You know, they're, they're oh, picking yeah, the beginning. Them. Yeah. And um, you know, there's some some back chat about Rufo, um, and that you know he's sort of he's sort of saying, "Oh, you mercenaries, you know, you you'll just kill for money. You don't care who you kill as long as as long as you get paid." Mm-hmm. And he's giving really giving Curry some sort of barbs, you know, and um, the guy's like, "Oh, so what? You know, why don't you pick on someone? Sort of, why don't you pick on someone your own size, sort of thing?" And um, mm-hmm. And uh, Curry just snaps back to him and he goes, kick your mouth off me. You're not in good enough shape. That that badass sort of like action line. Rod Taylor is so convincing as Curry. He has a swagger, doesn't really, he? Real sort of like swagger. And, you know, he's he's butch. He's, he's sort of well built, but he's not too overly like macho, like bulging muscles, sort of an Arnie sort mm-hmm. of character. He's not expendable level. That's it, yeah. He's ridiculousness. They're, they're all believable characters. And I think mm. that might come down to sort of Mike Mike Hoare being involved. It's believable. And his character is meant to be based on Mike Hoare anyway. So it, it makes sense to me. So I think that brings us into Final Thoughts. I was I was surprised by how much I enjoyed it. Mm, definitely. So I don't know whether you want to talk about the, the the very end of the movie. Yeah. Okay. Well, the very end. Yeah. A little bit because that's one of the points that kind of lets it down for me. Yeah. So spoilers again. Sorry. It's um, you know the nature of the beast. We 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 have to spoil films. So Rufo, as we mentioned earlier, has been murdered, mm. and uh, Curry has gone off to try and get some fuel delivered, dropped by the UN or whoever yeah. you know the Congolese government. Um, so they can fuel the trucks and get back. Mm-hmm. And there's a little scene with uh, Rufo and, and uh, Curry mm-hmm. in on the way when they're driving. And Rufo basically asks him, why are you fighting? Why are you here? And this is where their relationship continues to develop. And it plays into the end. So we'll have to spoil this bit. We have to. Yeah. Basically, Rufo is asking him, why are you here? Is it for money? Do you like killing? Mm. Like, I know why I'm here. And we know why he's here. It's his country. He's fighting for, you know, um, the way of life that he wants the country to have. Curry doesn't really give him an answer. No. Um, but you can see he's thinking. And it's made him think. And the, the relationship's sort of strained by this. Curry's plan is to take the fuel from the uh, trucks, fill up the jeep, and get to the local train station to call in for a resupply. At which point, uh, Corporal Kataki basically says, he's just going to leave us. Mm. And and Rufo kind of like defends him. It's also like in the distance, yeah, it's yeah, a conversation yeah. that's muffled. And he comes back and the exposition is explained. He doesn't trust you. Taylor's like, do you trust me? Yeah. And, you know, there's the suggestion that he might run off with the diamonds and just leave them there to get consumed by the Simbas. Um, so in a gesture of, you know, trust and friendship uh curry says well you keep the diamonds i'll I'll take kataki with me and i'll be back when i'm you know i've sent the message definitely and that that's sort of like taylor's still a little bit spurned by Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the suggestion that he's only in it for the money and you know he he doesn't care about his actual friend rufo rufo has sort of come around to this and he, he he thinks that taylor does trust him you know because he's offer to give him the diamonds you know leave them there because he will come back mm-hmm. but rufo sneakily puts them back into the jeep the toyota land cruiser and he drives off and rufo is killed by henline once taylor comes back he finds that rufo has been murdered his friend's been killed so he chases um henline in what has to be one of the most off-road sort of like chases ever so Henline is on like a raft made of four branches. <laughs> it's on like a bamboo raft or yeah. something. Yeah. How he stays on that raft is incredible. Yeah. He's proper like, you know, California IA surfer dude on yeah. it. It's so like weird. Peak German balance. Re- yeah. yeah. Um, the lads from the the, the company, they, they've let him mm. basically escape down the river towards Uganda. Mm. Don't know why one of them didn't drop him with an SLR. But yeah, Rod Taylor's character hunts him down. There's a climatic fight. And Henline is brutally killed. Yeah, well, Curry stabs him to death with um, with Rufo's combat knife. You know, which is quite symbolic in itself. 
you don't see it because it's a you know it's a 60s film kataki is there he comes to find them mm. and kataki is sort of like overwhelmed by how viscerally horrendous the seeing the stabbing of henline was not only is he lost sort of the totem of what the future of his country is going to be like with the death of rufo mm. but his other officer has just brutally murdered another officer it's like being in the Simbas at that point. It's a representation of brutality that he's just struck by. On initial viewing, I mean, I think me and you both agree. We were like, "Oh, well, this tonal is tonally is very odd." But when you say explain it like that, I, I can totally understand why Kataki is sort of repulsed and shocked by the brutality because he's fighting to see a day where the the brutality that the Simbas are are showing yeah. everyone around them is gone. I can understand his repulsion to to Curry's actions, especially someone who we saw him and Curry have got quite a strong bond um, as a CEO to, to enlisted man. So I can totally see why it's like that. I mean, but maybe on a first viewing, it isn't, it isn't so obvious. Well, we watched it pretty late on and I kind of missed the nuances of the scene. And when I watched it back, I was like, okay, this makes more sense. It does, yeah. It still doesn't lift the ending. No, it doesn't lift it. The ending is still mm. a little cack-handed, in my opinion. Just a tiny bit. Because on reflection, the ending actually mm. makes sense. You know, it is, as you say, it's more nuanced than it, it gives off initially. Yeah. I don't think the film's overly long. I think it's actually very, very well-paced. It is. Yes, it is definitely well-paced. doesn't outstay its welcome. I still want to know if they get back with the diamonds. Very impressed with the movie this week, actually. Um, from a technical standpoint, the story was, was quite strong. The set pieces were very good and well done. The cast are doing a bang-up job. Everyone's playing their part. No one's phoning in, I don't think. I can understand why it's a cult classic and I can understand why it's so beloved and why it's revered by people like Quentin Tarantino. I totally get it. I mean, to explain my issue with the ending, on the drive back, um, Curry, he's processing the death of his friend and what Kataki has said to him. Over the top is... Um, what Rufo has said to him in the past, you know, during the conversations in the train, in, in the Jeep, when they had the confrontation. And he realizes he needs to be a better man. He, he can't just be this soldier of fortune. Yeah. Um, and he, he puts himself up for court martial and he stops the column, calls Kataki over, hands him his Browning high power and says, I, I want to be put under, I want to be court martialed, put under arrest. That's noble, mm. but you aren't back yet. This isn't the time. You can't put a corporal in command of this convoy. Yeah, because what happens if you're under attack and... Yeah. I can understand, like, if he'd done that when they got back, that would make sense. Because um, he's clearly going to be exonerated. Yeah, of course. Because Henline, you know, murdered children, attempted to rape and murder Claire, and tried to steal the diamonds. And I'm not sure you would hold someone like that in prison if they just got $50 million worth of diamonds back for you. I think you'd probably sweep that under the carpet. When you think about it, it doesn't really work. They could have achieved that same ending and moral note another way. Mm. They could they could have done it in a way that probably would have worked a little better for me. Um, it's kind of jarring. The two lads fighting were broken up, and you know someone could have said, "Look, you know this isn't the way. You know we have to. We should try Henlon for his crimes. You know mm. if, if this is the way that we want the country to be going forward, then we need to implement law." now within, within this is what rufo would have wanted if kataki had broken them up come over and said no th this is you know this is wrong captain yeah and that had been the moment where that moral flip had come in mm. curry realizes no you're right yep rufo would have wanted us to do this properly uh we can't bring ourselves down to the level of the simbas so yeah i think it could have been done a little bit better but overall i think it's a fantastic movie i think it's the most artistic most competently made mercenary movie I've ever seen. It stands up cinematically. Mm. It stands up in terms of cast. Wish I'd see. Wish we'd seen more of Kenneth Moore, but definitely, yeah, it's a mm. shame. But what can you do? Yeah. Um, there's very few places that the, the the movie falls down. It's paced well, mm. shot beautifully. The acting's great. The script is good, and it's you know so the action sequences are surprisingly modern. Yeah. So much so that they influence people like Tarantino. So, I don't think you can say any fairer than that, really. I think it's on a par with Wild Geese for mercenary films, the, the, the original. Yeah, I can see why. I can see why. I hadn't seen it before. Yeah. I'd always meant to, but it's so hard to find. Very difficult. 
so I can understand why people were saying when we were talking about um, mercenary movies on on Twitter mm. uh, at Fighting on Film. Follow us if you aren't. I can understand completely why people were saying you've got to cover Dark of the Sun. Exactly. What's the other name of it? Mercenaries? Mercenaries in the UK. It was released called The Mercenaries. I hope we did it justice, listeners um, and fans of Dark of the Sun. We're doing a bonus mystery movie, but we're not going to reveal what that is yet. So please follow us on the Twitter and all shall be revealed. Also, uh, Parish Notes, we're holding a quiz. So um, if you'd like to take part, um, follow us on the Twitter and there'll be a tweet and I'll pin it um, the week of release. And that's on the Friday. Going to be great fun. Going to be great fun. War movie theme quiz over Zoom. We hope to see a few of you fellow listeners there. So as always, drop us a like, a comment, a subscription, an Apple written review if you're listening on Apple Pods. We'd love to read them. And we will catch you in the next one. Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks a bunch. See you soon.